Hello, young students of ancient history. So, welcome back to uh, another exhilarating lecture here. And last time we had looked at the ancient Egyptian civilization, and today we're going to move into all of Asia, that we are going to uh, move out of the ancient Near East region and Egypt, and we're going to move to the other two uh, great civilizations of, uh, of Asia, of the ancient world, which is here in, uh, in India, present-day India, as well as in eastern uh, China. And we will also be examining here the, uh, the great steppe cultures, or very, very uh, uh, quickly looking at some of the, the great steppe cultures of uh, northern Asia here, and how these all tied in together. So just a, a quick review here, we have, have looked at the, the most ancient of civilizations in Mesopotamia, here in the, the Middle East, current day Middle East, we've looked at Egypt, and as I say, now we're going to shift our focus east to the, the remaining civilizations. And I want to start with examining China, which, like Egypt, developed in almost total geographical isolation, which created a uh, very strong cultural constant, like Egypt. Um, you don't see a lot of invasion. You see a lot of continuation within their spirituality, within their thought, and uh, they are protected by the uh, the great forests of uh, Manchuria here in uh, in the south and the the west. They are protected um, almost totally by uh, the the ocean on their east and the only real point of entry into China here is this great loop around the uh, the Yellow River and this is where the barbarians as they define them as the Chinese civilization defines them which are the uh, the, the uh, steppe people who descend out of Mongolia out of the north into uh, China into the civilized regions and here in the north here where the the uh, Yellow River is you see it's a it's a really flat area, drier area, um, where wheat is cultivated, and this river is known for its very violent floods, just like we saw in Mesopotamia. Um, not like the, the placid Nile floods that generally rise that are predictable. The Yellow River, like the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, are highly unpredictable and generate um, very terrible uh, flooding issues where people are killed and, and uh, farms, families, homes destroyed. And then you have the Yangtze River in the south, which is, uh, it's more predictable like the Nile River, um, but they do a lot of, it's a warmer climate, it's hotter, they do uh, more, much more rice uh, production there than wheat. But uh, just like in the previous civilizations we've examined, we see the development of large human populations and settled urban centers in river valleys here once again. And ancient China is going to be the largest population-wise and geographical region. There are over a, a thousand square miles is their civilization uh, early on. And um, this is really one of the great great civilizations in the ancient world throughout the whole period of this class. They will be the economic center of all things in the ancient world. That uh, Everyone wants what is made in China, and therefore great uh, trading routes develop, and China remains quite rich throughout its, its uh, history in the ancient world. So the first kind of prehistoric culture, meaning that we don't really have an understanding of, of written records at this time. They have symbolic things, um, but it's not, uh, we don't have written records yet for this period. It's the Lingshan culture. Uh, and later, the Shang dynasty will give us the first records, so we, we really only know what we can tell from archaeology. But what we can tell is that they were very sophisticated, that uh, the early Chinese were building walled cities, that they were producing their very famous silk that uh, that everyone in the world wants. So if you, anyone has ever worn wool, which is the primary uh, medium for making clothes or rough cotton, you can truly appreciate the 
lovely silks that come out of the east because they are so smooth and nice on your skin um, it is uh, it's a great thing to have and it's highly sought after by um, people who have a lot of money throughout the ancient world and uh, they're particularly famous for this black pottery and these oracle bones and uh, as you can see over here that what's an oracle bone well somebody wants to know what they should plant for their crop, when they should plant their crop, what they should do in a particular situation, you would ask your ancestors. Uh, the Chinese are renowned for their sort of reverence of, of uh, their ancestors and, and the, the people, the generations that went before them. And they believed that, that uh, through, the, through spiritual mediums that they could harness the power of their ancestors and they would give them wisdom on how to do things. So they would write down uh, a prophet, or they, or they would write down uh, a question that they would have on these oracle bones, and then they would go to a, a seer or a, a divine, and uh, they would uh, they would cast these things, and they would de then determine the ancestors would give them a vision, or they would uh, tell them what they needed to do. Again, this is uh, people don't understand the forces of nature. They don't know when floods are coming. They don't know when frosts are coming. Uh, they don't have an understanding of of uh, science or or uh, nature in, in a really systematic way like we would. So they are using a spiritual medium to help them uh, predict the future is what they are. Or they, they need to know how to do these things so they will survive. So we see the development of Chinese writing about the same time as we see writing developing at, uh, other places in the world and it is a totally independent invention and it's around 3000 BC and it's Pictographic, and remember last time I, I talked about um, the difference between pictographic writing and alphabetic writing. So there are almost uh, 3,000 symbols within uh, ancient Chinese, and uh, some uh, this the script is still in use today, although there's a more shorthand version. But it's a sub highly, highly, it's the most highly sophisticated pictographic language that we have um, in the world. But each symbol has its own meaning, right? It's not an alphabetic writing. And within legend, uh, this, uh, this early writing tells us of, of these five legendary emperors. So when you think of the Epic of Gilgamesh and you think of the legendary king Gilgamesh, China, like the ancient Mesopotamians, also have legends of the, these... Uh, these divine emperors, they call them the five sage emperors, and they are responsible for the major inventions and major technological breakthroughs um, that helped create Chinese society. And you have, with each one of these emperors, uh, that they are legendary. These are not actual emperors, but you have the creation of something that is tremendously important for the advancement of society. So Sheng Nong is a, the divine farmer who invents a plow. And uh, Emperor Yu, who is the father of irrigation and dams, and there's a great flood myth that goes along with him. And then you have Fuxi with the domestication of animals, um, and Emperor Yao with the uh, with reverence to the gods and new rituals, and Wang Di, who invents writing, silk making, and of course, the bow. So these are again all very important inventions and things that advance Chinese civilizations. And going back to the flood myth, just like with Gilgamesh, we see another society with another flood myth here. Um, all of these things relate back to agriculture and the settlement of, of human civilization in river valleys. And here's a, a quote from the right, one of the writings uh, about uh, Emperor Yu. It's, it talks, and Emperor Yu is, is, of course, famous for building dams and irrigation systems on the Yellow River. As I said, terrible flooding occurs there. So like endless boiling water, the flood pouring forth destruction. Boundless and overwhelming, it overtops hills and mountains, rising, ever rising, it threatens the very heavens. How the people must be groaning and suffering. So this is very similar to the, the prayer of the righteous sufferer that we see out of um, Mesopotamia that describes the flood as a horrific thing. And unlike the writing from uh, the proverb out of Egypt where the flood is a wonderful thing that the uh, people are looking forward to. So in the Shang dynasty, 
this is where we have our first system of writing and we see the development of uh, social systems here. Um, we began to see a highly nuanced social hierarchy where you have a, a clear king with, with uh, something like nobles and a, the, the unification of formerly kind of tribal regional areas. And you see specialization. Again, there's a large population with enough time to specialize. So we see a warrior caste. We see people who can specialize in making things like pottery and, and uh, weapons and plows and, and these sorts of things. And again, you can't do this unless you have a highly sophisticated civilization that produces enormous amounts of food so people can do things other than farm. So the next dynasty is the uh, Zhu. The, the, uh, my Chinese pronunciation is awful, so I apologize. Um, I think it's actually pronounced the Zhu dynasty. And the Zhu dynasty unifies the Chinese heartland around the year 500. And... This is where we see this, this uh, tremendously sophisticated philosophy for ruling come into effect here. And this is called the Mandate of Heaven. And this basically means that the emperor, whoever, the, the king is transformed into this almost divine figure. Much like we see in, in uh, Egypt with Pharaoh being the, the god king. So there, the king himself is head of this divine order, and he is able to change anything, that he is head of everything, and that he speaks uh, with uh, the authority of with nature, of the authority of heaven, the gods, and the ancestors. And the only way to get rid of a king is to conquer a king. And um, this particular dynasty is responsible for um, creating a, a more, much more advanced agricultural uh, processes and technology, to developing uh, a government that is highly uh, socially uh, stratified, almost feudalistic, I guess you could say. And um, they begin building these great uh, packed walls in the north, right, the beginnings of the the, uh, the Great Wall. And by the year 500, we see um, that chi the Chinese civilization has 20 million people. This is an enormous population, by far the largest population in the ancient world for any one region or people that speak uh, the same languages. So you can't talk about China without talking about the Great Wall. And the Great Wall is begun, as I say, around 500, um, and it is not one contiguous structure that you would see today as the Ming Wall, um, this famous large, massive stone structure that snakes along uh, mountain ranges and, and all of northern China, um, but rather this is something that is constructed in areas uh, that are specific, that have high traffic, um, to protect the Chinese from these raiders from the north that descend in on their civilization from time to time. So, of course, it is both a defensive structure and it is also a trade barrier because what do emperors need to sustain empires? Well, they need tax money. So, along with barbarians coming in, also there are smugglers and things of that sort who wish to avoid paying taxes. So, it is more than just defense, but it's also a trade barrier. And it is also, um, recent scholars have suggested it's, it is also a cultural border. And it is as much part of the Chinese culture in keeping people in as keeping people out. So it's a clear, uh, it's a clear demarcation of where China uh, ends and uh, the, sort of this, this uh, barbarian land begins. So... Never think of the wall as just strictly a defensive border, but it is many things. 
So around 500 as well begins this period of what they call the Warring States period. And it's a, it's a collapse of central government, much like what we saw in the Middle Kingdom in Egypt. Um, and out of this time, I'm not going to discuss all the political ramifications, but there is a spiritual enlightenment that when societies devolve into regional anarchy, there are great masters that rose up in, in uh, China that questioned what are we doing what is the purpose of life and how do we live life to its fullest how do we live well what is happiness they they begin to ask these questions how do people live virtuously and one of these great masters was confucius who uh, his students write down the the analects which is a moral philosophy and confucius stresses this concept of Rin or uh, virtue, civility, and uh, a golden rule type of, um, of moral philosophy. Right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, Confucius is constantly stressing the importance of personal virtue in the world, that you have to behave well. You have to honor your father or your mother. Um, you have to behave well if one wants to honor your ancestors, if one wants to bring virtue upon yourself. And it's important for this world, not the next world. Confucius was actually pressed on this subject of, is there an afterlife? And he sort of demurs, he doesn't, he doesn't want to answer. Um, but he, his philosophy is very much on this world. And there's a third, a second school of thought that develops is uh, in, in uh, contrast to Confucian thought in that one uh, stresses the optimism in humanity, that the that people need to be taught well, that they need to be instructed through virtue, whereas legalism says human beings are not worthy of teaching virtues because they will just misbehave no matter what. You can never, you can never mold humans into really good things. And that is and that rather that you have to punish them, that coercion, that uh, legal ramifications for bad action is the only way that you can make society good. So a much more strong-handed um, legalistic approach. And then you have um, Lao Tzu, and if anybody who wants to go off to California and live in a hippie commune, this is your guy, this is your philosopher. That uh, Lao Tzu sort of, uh, there's an image of him here, that he sort of just stressed, follow the way. If you eliminate your desire and your hard striving to get ahead in society, you're going to find happiness. That uh, the way is this loose concept that if you fight and, uh, and struggle against the way, um, that you're going to, to uh, be pulled down under the current of life. And often the images of swimming against the current in a river are uh, used to describe the way. So if you eliminate desire, if you eliminate striving, um, you are going to find happiness. And Lao Tzu famously just rides off into the woods uh, on a water buffalo, and he's never seen again by his disciples. So he uh, he's your guy if you are, are uh, kind of a commune type person. So shifting our examination to the Indus Valley here in the ancient civilizations of India. And uh, the two great developments, or the great civilizations um, here along the Indus River Valley, again, another development in another river valley, are Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro. And sadly, we have no written records for this society or this civilization. Um, and there are, there were legendary memories of this society and uh, as Charles Mason the the British uh, explorer waded through the Indus Valley and the jungles of northern India um, he stumbles upon these great fabled cities of mud brick and um, people didn't believe him until they were kind of discovered again in the 1920s and there were systematic archaeological 
excavations done. And actually, the uh, these cities were pillaged. The reason, the only reason they found them was because they were pillaged of their mud brick, and they built uh, more than uh, 90 miles of railroad base to to lay track on um, by using the mud brick of these ancient civilizations. And um, these are massive, massive cities, is what I'm hinting at by this, um, that each civilization in, at Harappa and uh, Mohenjo-daro, they're great cities, uh, that suggest that they would have had as many people as were in uh, the great cities of Mesopotamia, having 30 to 40, even 50,000 inhabitants in each of these places. So again, it shows extreme agricultural prosperity. And here you can see some of the, the civilizations and how people would have migrated in. And we believe that within these societies, in uh, that the both the Ganges uh, River as well as the Indus River had very highly sacred qualities. That, like everywhere, agriculture is key. So uh, people worshipped water; that it was revered as being sacred, having animistic qualities. So Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, these great cities here, you can see them, and this is uh, sort of laid out, and there's a massive public bath here that, um, uh, and there's no real temples of gods or anything of that nature. There's no priests, there's no images of kings. Um, so we, may th we think that this society may have been matriarchal in its origin. There's not a warrior caste. There's not a, a priestly caste that we see everywhere else that is developing in the world that we know was patriarchal, meaning that men ruled the society. So we there's a, a theory, and this is just a theory, that actually the Indus Valley civilizations were matriarchal societies. And they are Again, highly sophisticated societies. Um, there we see specialization uh, occurring shortly after uh, the year 3000, and we see um, the development of great systems that bring in, take out water. Um, there is systematic city planning and standardization. So again, all of this suggests high amounts of sophistication. No written language. Like early Chinese culture, um, we have to go on only what we see as uh, from archaeology alone. And But you see enormous amount of sophistication. You see uh, highly developed artwork. You see um, great systems of mathematics for city planning. So... What happens to this great civilization in uh, Harappa and Mohenjo-daro? Well, they are subjected to uh, exterior forces that we see invasions from these people that are originally called the Aryans, um, and not to be mistaken with um, the Aryan theories of Adolf Hitler in Germany, but these are the original Aryan peoples that migrate out of the Asian steppes, um, that they are much more uh, warlike than the civilizations of the Indus Valley, and therefore they are able to conquer eventually the civilizations in this river valley. So when when the Aryans descend and conquer, um, they impose their culture upon the earlier society. So we see a much more patriarchal culture. Um, and we see this uh, this movement towards uh, a more nomadic pastoralism from the settled urban agriculture. So you don't have the massive, huge cities. Um, they are abandoned in some cases. And we see the implementation of this new Indo-European language um, that is Sanskrit. That almost all languages within uh, India, within Europe, are part of this Indo-European language culture. Um, and Sanskrit is among them. And we have to question always whether this is a migration or it is an invasion. And we see definite elements that there is an imposition of this culture, so it may suggest it's 
partially a migration, but certainly there are invasion and, uh, and takeover elements within this, this movement of peoples. And we see a transformation of this religious culture from this sort of pantheistic or nature worship to uh, new gods being development. So there's a radical new cultural, religious, spiritual shift here. Remember, going from the, the animistic river to the, uh, to the anthropomorphic gods. And this is really the birth of Hinduism and the, the Vedas, or the sacred text. Uh, we have this written language, and the earliest writings are within these Vedas from the Aryan peoples. And there are, the, the Vedas are the sort of Bible of Hinduism, and they are four texts. And you have the Rig Veda, which is the, the oldest, and this is sort of an expounding of wisdom. Uh, of wisdom. You have the Mahaparata which is epic poetry, the, the, the songs and, and uh, poems of the conquest of the land, the Rahamayana, which again is a similar thing, and then you have the Upanishads, which is sort of mystical writing about uh, the gods and, and legendary figures. So what is Hinduism made up of? Remembering Egypt, that the life cycles of Pharaoh and the sun, the, the rising of the sun, the giving of life to agriculture, and then the returning of night. So this life cycle of, of birth, life, and afterlife, right? The, the death comes after life. Here in the Hindu pantheon, you see something similar. So you see Brahma, creation, Vishnu, the sustainer, the creator, the sustainer, and Shiva, the destroyer. And then rebirth in life, or into a, a new life. But Hinduism will invent something uh, called the transmigration of the souls, or reincarnation. And in Hinduism, uh, you have caste. And you are part of a, any particular caste in society that is the most elevated are the Brahmins, or the priests. Then the Kshatriya caste, which are warriors. Uh, Vishnas are merchants, landowners, and sort of things. And Shudras, sort of um, servants. And then you have these things that are called the Dalits, or untouchable peoples that are slaves, and, um, people who have to clean out latrines, things like that, the, the lowest levels of society. And it, how does one uh, stay in this caste system? Well, you are reincarnated into something else. So if you do your duty within your caste, you will then advance to the next caste. Or you, if you do it extraordinarily well, you might eventually uh, be, be uh, you can hop several castes and, and become something better in the next life. So you are, when you die, you are reincarnated. Your soul, this, this living essence within you, um, is reborn into a new body. And if you, uh, similarly, if you don't perform your cast well, you can decline, even all the way into an animal. And um, so this is the system of, of reincarnation. And we have here, how do, you, how do you do your duty well? Well, you do your dharma. So that is a moral duty. And we're going to see within the Bhagavad Gita, which is this reading that I have set, um, this, this figure, this uh, Prince Arshnu, who is speaking to Krishna, one of the, the Hindu gods, and he's asking, um, do I have to do my moral duty? Do I have to fight against my kinsmen? And ultimately, Krishna says, yes, Prince Arshna, you do have to do your dharma. Even though you don't want to fight and kill your own family, it is your duty based upon your warrior class that you are a member of the Kshatriya class. Therefore, you have to do your dharma. And if you do your dharma well, which is your moral duty, then you accumulate karma. And when you have good karma, you are... Uh, reborn into a higher class, or eventually the goal is to attain moksha, or this kind of more Buddhist sense of nirvana, that you are liberated from the cycles of rebirth and you get to go and live among the gods. So what does this system do? Well, it keeps good moral order within society, and it, it, um, it encourages people to do their duty honorably and well. 
and that you, if you do your duty well in society, that you are going to, um, you are going to get rewarded with a higher and better class um, in in uh, your next life. So we will now move away from the great civilizations and and uh, religions of India to the Asian steppes. So I want to really here we have a massive, massive grassland. Um, and this is what a steppe is. It's really just the high plains. If anyone has been to South Dakota or Kansas, so the western Kansas, this is what the Asian steppes are. It's just this vast 6,000 mile highway of endless grasslands. And we can see here in this very sophisticated map that I have drawn um, the regions, the main steppe regions. And this is the East Asian steppe, the Central steppe, and the Western Caspian steppes, named after the Caspian Sea. Excuse me, that's the Black Sea. The Caspian Sea is right here. Um, and these are the main steppe regions. And these steppe peoples participate in trade with um, the great civilization, the, the settled civilizations of the world, and the Han Chinese are part of this. Um, and the steppe peoples are both enemies and can be friends to the Chinese cultures in East Asia, which is where they, they really develop their heartland, is Mongolia. So that is this region here. Remember, that is why the Chinese build the Great Wall is to encourage uh, a defensive barrier, a trade barrier, and a cultural barrier. That what that is what is distinguishes themselves. But here you can see kind of this image of this just vast ocean of grassland as far as the eye can see. Again, here's a more political map. Here is the heartland, and people these steppe people will move west and east. That they will. They will. Uh, they are people who live on horses, who are nomadic peoples. They are not settled peoples that live in river valleys, like all the other civilizations that we will see in China, in India, and in uh, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and these river valleys. But rather, they are people that develop on these wide open plains, and they live differently. Therefore, they don't have settled agricultural societies, but rather they have, they have uh, nomadic. Societies that are predicated on their um, their sheep and cattle, and you can see that they were they are scary people because they don't have a developed they don't have uh, um, written languages they don't have settled civilizations therefore they are thought to be quite barbaric and scary peoples. They are terrifying to settled societies, and we see that this is the case in China. We see this is the case in Rome. Um, and China constructs this wall, and it's sort of a, a simple uh, state or a statement, um, but China built a wall, therefore Rome fell. That um, because of China's... Um, construction of this this defensive cultural and trade barrier it encouraged the migration of these steppe peoples like the mongols like the huns and various turkmen peoples west that they eventually moved west and over thousands of years they eventually found the roman empire now that's a little simplistic but there is some truth in this and uh China's relationship with the steppe peoples is complicated. And there is a great give and take. And very wise Chinese emperors and generals said you do not fight the barbarians directly because they are extremely good warriors, but rather you employ them to fight other barbarians, that you use them to trade with, um, and there develops this caste of nearer and farer 
barbarians, that uh, the people who live the closest to China are the nearer barbarians. And um, these people can be employed, that they are used uh, to, to uh, deal with the far barbarians or the more wild tribal peoples that uh, cannot be controlled. Um, so the Chinese have a very complicated relationship with uh, people of the steppes. And again, I said this great trade route develops, um, call, we call the Silk Road, and it was really only coined in the late uh, 19th century. Um, but this is a highly sophisticated trade route that moves all the way from eastern China um, through the, through, uh, the uh, Asian steppes here, just the uh, skirts along the uh, northern part of the Himalayan mountains um, and the southern portion of the Asian steppes. Here's a more clear map, I think. Um, but this is a, a very highly sophisticated trade route that employed the or that uh, employed thousands and thousands of people across thousands and thousands of miles to bring these luxury trade goods of spices, of silk, of all the things that people wanted from the east to the west. That is what the Silk Road was. And it is plagued um, often by these peoples, these nomadic peoples of the steppes. And great trading cities developed. That uh, the trading caravans would move from the east uh, along, uh, the, from the Jade Gate, which is, is the, the sort of legendary um, Entrance, or the beginning of the Silk Road um, through um, the uh, Jaxartes River, as we would know it, through the Oxus River in this region of Transoxiana, and, uh, which is a, a Greek name. And um, these just fabled cities of Bukhara, of Samarkand, um, developed, and they were vastly rich. Um, but they had to pay off, that they had to employ, that they had to defend these massive thousand uh, uh, camel caravans um, from these kind of barbaric peoples that would descend from the north. And this was one of the most rich, Transoxiana was one of the richest regions of the world. Um, and now it's one of the poorest. But this is present day Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, um, and this is where all these, um, these tribal peoples came ultimately to settle, which is why it holds their names, the Uzbeks, the Turkmen people, that settled in these, this formerly uh, vastly rich region of uh, Transoxiana. And these are nomadic peoples. They're hunter-gatherers to still to some degree that they're pastoralist, and they had to use these great thousand mile uh, highways for grazing of their people and they would or their their uh, not their people but their um, their animals and one of the great dates um, is the or the, the great events is the the uh, domestication of the horse and we believe that the, the domestication of the horse happened around 3500 BC. And this the domestication of the horse allowed for the creation of the horse archer and the use of the compound bow, that these nomadic peoples of the steppes were able to harness this great and powerful bow that had knockdown power that we don't see until really the invention of the repeating rifle in the 1850s and 60s. So this allowed for the, uh, the Asian steppe peoples to be um, a highly sophisticated and sought after um, group of warriors that civilizations regularly employed and were defeated by. And these were terrifying people. Again, this knockdown bow and the invention of the iron stirrup um, allows for um, just incredibly powerful uh, warrior 
uh, uh, groups within this, this, these um, nomadic peoples. And this here, again, is the compound bow that just has, it's very short, and it has enormous knockdown power that is only really rivaled in the ancient world by the English longbow, which is invented for thousands and thousands of years um, after that. But uh, these, these, uh, these great warriors um, were able to ride up at a full gallop, stop, fire a couple shots, um, and gallop away as fast as they could, which is just devastating to ancient armies. And certain great generals like an Alexander, um, were able to um, defeat these nomadic armies, but usually, usually, settled legionnaires are not successful in defeating um, mounted horse archers. Just It just usually doesn't happen. And it takes an enormously uh, disciplined force, uh, and it requires an enormously uh, great general, or that a very great general and uh, a highly disciplined army in order to defeat a group of horse archers. So, as I said earlier, China built a wall, therefore eventually Rome falls. And these groups of Turkmen nomadic peoples come out of their heartlands in, um, in Mongolia and they migrate across the Asian steppes back and forth along with weather patterns. Um, and they eventually come into um, present day Iran Persia, uh, Mesopotamia, and again we see these mountain people that push in to civilized regions. We see this happening in northern India in their civilizations, in China, um, and then of course in eventually in Greece and Rome, especially the Roman Empire with Attila the Hun. So this will be a constant theme of nomadic peoples pushing into civilized areas. So this is a very and highly important hallmark of the ancient world is the steppe peoples of the north pressing in on the civil settled civilizations of the river valleys um, throughout the ancient world. So thank you for watching, for listening, and I hope that you will come to have an appreciation for the peoples of Asia, of the steppes, of the Ganges, as well as the Indus River Valley civilizations, and the peoples of the that developed in the Yellow and Yangtze River Valleys. So, I will see you next time. Again, thanks for um, watching and coming to learn.